Okay, we're back from our break, and uh, we raised a lot of interesting questions on the break, and about playing the game in the uh, in the world of the Crusades. Um, you know, I wanted to go through a couple more questions, but before we start with that, maybe we'll look at our our, our syllabus again and. Uh, we actually have two more nights of lecture on, on specific topics uh, before we wind up. Um, and so we actually have one more book to read, Why, right? I know you're all really happy that we're getting to the very last book. Um, the last book is next week on the Albigensian Crusade and the Song of the Cathar Wars, which I think you'll find will be like Robert of Clary, a story of adventure and warfare and political dealings back and forth. I think you'll enjoy reading that. And we have that for next week. And then the following week, you don't have an assignment, but your research papers are due uh, at the next meeting. Okay. So um, uh, if everybody's all uh, set with that, any questions on your research paper at this point? You should be pretty close to the end. Anybody have any, any last minute questions? Can we get a moratorium on it? <laughs> no, you can't. You absolutely can't have a moratorium. It's due two weeks from tonight. Okay. Okay, but your last reading assignment is next week. Okay, then let's return to um, uh, a few comments about the Fourth Crusade. Um, I have some questions. What is the ultimate impact of the Fourth Crusade on the Byzantine Empire? Well, the answer to that is... Of course, it eliminates it partially for a while, and, and it, it fatally weakens it. And so that when, when the Byzantines reconquer, they're never that strong again so that they can take, take over it. How about on the future of crusading in the Holy Land? Uh, what do you think the impact might be uh, of the Fourth Crusade on the future of crusading? Yeah. Well, it, it marked the end because there was no more Holy Land crusades. It marked the end of the Holy Land Crusade because they never made it and it set a precedence to uh, crusade against Christians. Yeah, in a way, but except that there are some other crusades. There's the Fifth Crusade and then there's going to be St. Louis Crusade and there'll be a couple more crusades. But, but you know, it, it's, really, it's really quite clear to us now that it's a lost cause at this point. Yeah, what do you think, Matthew? I tend to agree with your, with your argument at the beginning of the class saying that um, it seems like, in, um, with starting with the fourth, you know, kind of sort of third, but really with the fourth, um, that you know things start to, you know, it, it becomes an institution. Okay, crusade. Okay, you can take the cross, go against uh, the heathen here or there, or some, you know, someplace else. You know, um, you know, instead of it being you know, purely a holy land uh, objective, it's now a uh, enemy of enemy of the pope. Yeah, yeah, and it's now directed against uh, the enemy of the Pope, and, and the Holy Land just becomes one of any number of places where you can go on crusade, whereas before, the Holy Land was the whole focus of everything. Well, Innocent III ended up calling a total of some five crusades, and, and um, actually more than five crusades. I think I ended up with seven, and I forgot to go back and change that number. Let me count them before I change the number. Okay, the Fourth Crusade, the Albigensian Crusade, which was in southern France against the heretic Cathars, the Livonian Crusade in the Baltic, which is Albert of Buxtehude against the pagans, and then he called a crusade against Marquard of Anne Wheeler in southern uh, Italy, another Saladin he called him in Sicily, the Spanish Crusade, the Children's Crusade, the Fifth Crusade, and I... Did I get them all on that one page, or are there are there more? Let me see. Yeah, no, that's all. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, actually, Innocent called seven crusades. No other pope did that. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. Sorry, what was the Children's Crusade? The Children's Crusade was actually inspired by the preaching of Fulk of Neuilly. Remember we talked about his theory about only the poor and humble are worthy of going on crusade and only the poor and humble can be like Christ and, and win the crusade. I mean, this is utter rubbish. And, 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 um, but people believed him and the children were inspired and they dropped everything and they went on crusade. And I think it's probably more the teens than, than the really young children. But even so, I mean, they just... 
marched into slavery and starvation, uh, just like the, the People's Crusade of the First Crusade. So they never, they never made to never made it to the Holy Land. Yeah. Did Innocent actually take credit for the Children's Crusade, or did he just kind of shrug it off and ignore it? Sort of? I, I think he didn't actually call it. I may, I may be slightly inaccurate about saying he, he called it, and, and he didn't take credit for it. It just happened. I mean, it, it happened as a result. It was a spontaneous movement in Europe as a result of folk of Nuili's uh, preaching. But nevertheless, I mean, uh, then maybe we can say Innocent himself called six crusades. But isn't that an incredibly extraordinary number of crusades? Something really important is going on in Innocent's reign as far as the concept of crusade is concerned. We're going to go through a few of these different crusades in um, Innocent's reign before we get on to the other crusades. Um, we'll, we'll talk about the Albigensian Crusade next week. We'll talk about the Livonian Crusade tonight. Uh, um, probably next week we'll talk about uh, the crusade of Mark Ward of Ann Wheeler, and we'll talk a bit about the Spanish Crusades tonight and the Fifth Crusade next week. Um, so we're spending a total of like three weeks on Innocent III and all his different crusades, I mean, because he called so many. And then after Innocent, um, the crusading movement goes on, but it's kind of an anticlimax, and, and the events he puts in motion last for a long time as well. Um, uh, it, we'll see that when we look at the other, well, at the other crusades. Um, Peter the Venerable and Hostiensis, um uh, said that crusades against heretics, schismatics, and rebels were even more necessary than those to the Holy Land. Um, the Pope had a de jure, but not a de facto, authority over infidels. And so, uh, in fact, what they're arguing is, it's, this is interesting, uh, this is really an interesting point. If they're arguing that the Pope had a de jure, but not a de facto, authority over infidels, what are they arguing? What does that mean? It means while he may he may legally have uh, political you know, may legally have political power in reality, he has no uh, clout with them at all. Doesn't that strike you as extraordinary that Peter the Venerable is arguing that the Pope has de jure, according to law, authority over all infidels? What is that statement saying? Can somebody restate that in in different terms? What does that argument mean? Matthew? The Pope is starting, is starting to become uh, king, king over all of the earth, basically. You know, you know, you know that whole uh, idea of uh, Innocent III uh, becoming a priest king mm -hmm. over, um, mm -hmm. over Christendom and beyond is and starting beyond. to become, and, and beyond is uh, starting to become a reality, at least in uh, a legal sense. No, well, that's what he's arguing. Okay, Stephen, did you have a comment on that? I was going to add on top of that, that just the general church view that holy law is the absolute law, no matter where you are, and it's the Pope's job yeah. to enforce that in all instances. Yeah, that holy law is the absolute law. But the thing that struck, just, just suddenly struck me as I read that, and I thought, wait a minute, wow. This is an argument that is that the Pope has authority over everyone in the whole world, not just Christians, but even infidels. And that, may, that would include the Muslims, that would include the pagans, the Wends, the, the Laps, the, the Lemonians, uh, every, uh, everybody in the whole world. And you know what strikes me as, as interesting about that? Uh, uh, de jure is by law, by law he has authority, but not de facto. Uh, not real authority in reality, but he has a de jure, a, a legal authority over all infidels. You know, this is exactly the argument that the Muslims are making now. This is the argument that our Muslim visitors made when they came here. Um, remember when they talked about um, the converts to Islam who were here, the two American uh, kids who were converts to Islam, and they made the point that they weren't converts, they were reverts. Remember them making that point? This, okay, the theoretical argument they're making is Islam is the, is the authentic religion for all people, 
And those who are not Islamic, they don't convert to Islam, they come back to their home in Islam. It's quite a similar argument to this one um, that they're making, that, that Peter the Venerable was making, that the Pope had a legal authority over everyone, not just Christians, but everyone. And, and that he has this legal authority to command these people to allow missionaries to preach in their lands. Okay. There's also a parallel with, um, with a point that one of our Muslim uh, friends made here when they visited that night, um, because actually, actually the imam made the point with me afterwards when I was asking him uh, how, the, um, how the Muslims justified their conquest of so many lands after the death of Muhammad, and he said, well, they resisted the message of Islam. Um, they resisted being preached, you know, uh, uh, the, the message of the true religion. And so that was the justification for all the conquests. This is exactly the point that, that Peter the Venerable is making here, that, um, that the Pope has the power to command all of these, all of these uh, pagans and infidels to allow missionaries to preach in their lands. The Pope could intervene directly in the affairs of infidels, and their refusal to recognize his dominion was in itself a justification for Christian attack. That's exactly the justification that um, Islam, the Islam is using, uh, was using, or is using today in, in, for people who resist their message. Yeah. Could you say that idea stemmed from the crusading movement in the sense that they might have taken it from the, um, during the attacks they got that idea and used it later on in the Christian view? No, no, I think it's a parallel development. I mean, I think it's a logical development in a, in a, a religion that believes it is the only true religion. And in both cases, you have religions that believe they are the only true religions. I mean, the Christians here believe that, and the Muslims believe it today and believed it then. And, and so, but now, now Christianity, or at least Western Christendom, has evolved to a different place where they're tolerant of other religions. And that hasn't happened in Islam, but it has happened in the Western Christian world, interestingly, uh, which might mean the end of Christianity. Um, when you think about it, because if you don't have that fervent belief that ours is the only answer, then you're going to have people falling away. So that's how that's that maybe this idea of tolerating other religions may spell the end of Christianity. Interestingly, okay. Well, let's get back to the Crusades. By the middle of the 13th century, crusading had become commonplace, and many families could look back on four or five generations of crusaders. Let's see, I've still got a couple of pages here. Uh, regular taxation for crusading was now established. The machinery for preaching was now well established. The rights and privileges of crusaders were now well established, and crusading had become a European move institution. But was it a movement, as Jonathan Riley Smith claims? We need next to examine the Northern Crusades, the Albigensian Crusade, and the Spanish Crusades, all waged within Europe. Now, the Holy Land is out of the question, and now we're going into Europe. Okay, so we're going to turn to our second topic for tonight, or, or actually we have a number of topics here. We're going to first look at the military orders, uh, which we've, we've sort of touched on all the way through here. We've talked about the Templars and the Hospitallers and the, and the, the Teutonic Knights. Um, and, and then, after we do a little bit on the military orders, we'll look at the Teutonic Knights and the Northern Crusades, which is what they carried out, and then we'll sort of end this lecture by looking at the military orders in Spain and how they carried out the conquest of Spain. And I want to recommend to you a couple of books here. Um, one is um, a primary source. This is the Rule of the Templars. And I ordered this book. It's in the, our bookstore if any of you are interested in it and want to read it. Um, it's an optional book, so you can, you can look at that. And this, these are the rules by which the Templars were governed. And so if you want to know the workings of the Templars, this is an excellent book. And on the front is the, uh, the same picture that's on their seal with two knights uh, riding uh, a horse. And I'm not sure exactly what that signifies. 
Um, here's a book that uh, takes in the entire um, um, body of all the religious orders, the monks of war, the military religious orders, and, and um, this, is an, this is an excellent book because it covers all the military orders, although there are newer books on each of the individual orders. If you want to know about all of them and sort of the military orders compared, this is, this is quite a good book. It's been criticized by some, but, but I kind of like it because there's so much information about all the different orders in it. Um, and for the Northern Crusades, um, this is an older book, but it's quite an excellent book. Um, the Northern Crusades, the Baltic and Catholic Frontier, 1100 to 1525 um, by Eric Christensen. And here we have some Northern Crusaders going, going off on crusade. Um, this is an older book, but it's quite good. Uh, in the me he was one of the first to write about the Northern Crusades, which had been pretty much ignored. And uh, even Jonathan Riley Smith in his textbook gives it a little spotty touch, a little bit here, a little bit there. He doesn't deal with them as an entire movement. And this is the first book to do that. Um, there are, have been a number of recent books that have come out about each of the individual Northern Crusades. But again, I like this one because it covers all of them. And, and so if you want a quick view of all the Northern Crusades, this is a good one. Okay, how about the military orders? In the wake of the First Crusade, a new kind of monastic organization emerged, the military orders, and they were fighting friars. They soon assumed a crucial role in the defense of the Crusader states. Um, they're almost a contradiction in terms. They're like a monastic order made up of fighting men, and they don't retreat from the world where they, you know, study in the or build a monastery in the wilderness or clear the forest or or retreat and, and spend their life praying. Instead, their, their action is in the world. They take vows of poverty and chastity and charity, just like monks do. They live together a celibate life, like monks do, and they live together in a community. But the express purpose for their organization is to fight wars, to fight wars, to protect crusaders, to protect pilgrims, um, to heal the sick who are, who are wounded along the way in the pilgrimage or to convert the infidels. And um, they're fighting friars. I don't know if you want to call them friars or monks. Um, but they take vows of, of individual poverty like, like monks do. But friars take vows of corporate poverty and the military orders do not. In fact, they all become very wealthy. So I don't agree that they're friars. I, I actually took this from a source, but I don't think they're friars. I, that's wrong. They're monks. Okay, because friars take vows of poverty. Okay, that's a more accurate way to do it. Around 1119, a French knight, Hugh of Paines, formed a small brotherhood to defend the pilgrim roads to Jerusalem, and he won the support of King Baldwin II of Jerusalem and of St. Bernard of Clairvaux. And you all remember that he was the great crusading preacher of the Second Crusade. These brothers were given a part of the temple as their headquarters, and so they became known as the Knights Templar, and they began fighting in the armies of the Crusader states. Quoting St. Bernard, who supported the Templars very enthusiastically, Bernard said, Go forward in safety, knights, and with undaunted souls drive off the enemies of the cross of Christ, certain that neither death nor life can separate you from the love of God which is in Jesus Christ, repeating to yourself, In every peril, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. How glorious are the victors who return from the battle! Rejoice, courageous athlete, if you live and conquer in the Lord, but exult and glory the more if you die and are joined to the Lord. Life indeed is fruitful and victory glorious, but death is better than either of these things. For if those are blessed who die in the Lord, how much more blessed are those who die for the Lord. Okay, this is St. Bernard, who, who, who was so fervent in preaching the crusade, and he is also the one who defined the sanctity of knighthood. And so this goes just a step further, that these knights are not only sanctified, but they become a monastic order. And it's a logical step. 
uh, that, that, I mean, when we think back about it and look at it, it's a logical step in the development of this theory of the san sanctity of knighthood. Well, another um, military order was formed around the hospital of St. John of Jerusalem, which was care founded for the care of the sick in the 11th century, actually before the Crusades. And so now, on the model of the Templars, uh, the Hospitallers, or the Knights of St. John, now take on the same role as, a, as the Templars. And in the 1130s, they begin to assume the military responsibilities. There's one argument that they're imitating the Muslim institution of ribat, which is um, when Muslims give temporary service in a frontier uh, fortress and they take vows, vows of um, celibacy and they fight for a limited amount of time. Uh, I don't. I don't think that. It, I, I think they're parallel developments. I don't think that the Christians modeled the military orders after any Muslim orders. I think rather they're a direct outgrowth of the sanctification of military lifestyle, and they're they're a logical step in the next direction. If you're going to sanctify the military life, why not have a sanctified order uh, of military monks? And that's exactly the direction they went in. Here is St. Bernard who pre preached this and who, who um, developed that theory. And here is the seal of the commandery of the Templars. And, and again, here is the seal um, uh, where they, uh, it's the army of Christ. This is the seal of the army of Christ, and here are two knights. I think that signifies brotherhood, that they're working together, that they're fighting together for the Lord. And, and, um, and so this is, this is their seal. Here is a knight of St. John, and again with a crusader cross on his cloak, but, and a sword. He's a warrior. Okay. Religious and moral obligations of knighthood were being stressed in Europe at this time, and fighting for Christ was now regarded as suitable for religious men. Sorry, I didn't get all the typos out. Uh, the Templars and the Hospitallers both were headquartered in Jerusalem and rapidly acquired extensive properties in Western Europe. In fact, um, uh, just, you know, there was this the, just explosion of sanctity among all the populations of Europe, and everybody just gave them land. Um, and, and when they were given land and manors and taxes and tolls and churches, of course, these are income-producing properties throughout um, Europe. And so the Templars and the Hospitallers became very, very wealthy. Uh, they had all these properties that were given to them in the West, and they established convert, converts in, or convents, they call them convents rather than abbeys, uh, throughout uh, Europe, Spain, uh, France, Germany, England, um, and there they recruited knights for their orders. Nevertheless, you know, their numbers remain, remained amazingly small. Uh, they had a, a very small number of actual knights, but they had all these converts, uh, convents everywhere, and they had to have knights there to man the converts as well as to fight in the Holy Land. The kings and nobles of the Crusader states lacked the manpower and the resources to have fighting men, and so they also gave or sold strongholds to the orders so that the orders could, could uh, station people in the various ca uh, castles that they built throughout the Holy Land, and they became the defenders of the Holy Land. The orders were entrusted with the defense of large stretches of frontier territory, the earliest example was the march in the Amanus region of northern Antioch for the Templars. The Hospitallers were assigned territories in northern Tripoli and southern Antioch. The Brethren also provided field service, but their numbers were very small. In 1187, the Templar, in 1187 again, that's the date they lost Jerusalem, right? The Templars lost 60 at the Battle of Cresson and 230 at the Battle of Hattin, and they were almost annihilated. So you see how small their numbers were in the Holy Land. But when you count them all in all of their convents throughout Europe, you're going to see that they had quite a lot. The brothers in the Holy Land also used auxiliary troops, including native Turcopoles. And Turcopoles were native troops that they hired as mercenaries. Okay, so they hired 
local troops, and some of them could be Muslims, as mercenaries to, um, to build up their ranks. They ended up acquiring great wealth, and the masters became significant political figures by 1087 as we saw them, um, as we saw them participating in the struggles for power among uh, the political figures who were fighting for the Kingdom of Jerusalem. But they did not abandon their obligations to the pilgrims. The Hospitallers maintained a hospital at Aquabella and Jerusalem, and both orders had many forts along the pilgrim routes, especially linking Jaffa, Jerusalem, and the Jordan River. Okay, and here uh, are the different uh, castles that they actually built. And this is in the early period. Um, uh, I didn't do a later map when it was so dotted with castles you could hardly see the map. I mean, there were so many. But this is at the, at the beginning of the Crusader period. And you can see the Hospitaller castles are in green and the Templar castles are in red. Even some of them are in Muslim territory, which is quite interesting. But, but they, they line the, the whole Holy Land and along all the frontiers. And so um, uh, they were really important in the defense of the Holy Land. After the failure of the Second Crusade in the East, the Crusaders were mostly on the defensive. And again, I'm sorry I made so many typos here. Uh, their castles became essential for their survival. Few lords could match the vast resources of the military orders. Uh, in fact, the military orders built some of the largest and most elaborate of all crusading castles. Uh, one of the optional books I had for you was Kennedy's book on Crusader castles, which, which outlines a good deal of what the Templars did in the Holy Land as far as building and um, defending all the castles. So if you're interested in reading about that aspect of the Templars, I recommend that book. It's called Crusader Castles by Kennedy. Um, they built some of the largest and most elaborate of all the crusading castles, and Crack de Chevaliers is an example that I have a picture of. Uh, but all the castles uh, were like that. Many were built. Many were built or elaborated from existing fortifications, Byzantine or Muslims, and many were built from scratch. I mean, they they just built an extraordinary number of castles, and the military orders had amazingly huge resources throughout. Western Europe. They had extensive holdings in Western Europe that provided the money, supplies, and manpower necessary, and they were just extremely wealthy, extraordinarily wealthy. Here's one of the castles that they built, the Crack de Chevalier, which is the most famous of the castles, and these are in fact, this is the ruins of the Crack de Chevalier. Here's another castle in Sidon, um, and this is a maritime castle. Castles were on top of hills and overlooking cities and on the sea coast to defend the shoreline. This is a, a maritime castle, and, and they're just everywhere in the Holy Land. As the military orders assumed an important role in the defense of the Latin East, as I said, they acquired property throughout Western Europe. And the income from that property financed the order's operations in the Holy Land. From their headquarters in Jerusalem, the Grand Masters of the Templars, Hospitallers, and Teutonic Knights ruled all of their orders. And, and they ruled from the Holy Land, and then they're, they're sort of, it's a reverse thing. Um, so they're ruling from the Holy Land, and all of their outlying districts are, are back in Europe. Um, so it's kind of a reverse of what's going on in the Holy Land. The Grand Master was elected, but once he was elected, all the other officials were appointed from the, by the Grand Master. So it, they, it's interesting, a combination of democracy and, and authoritarianism. Once they elected him, then he had the power to appoint everyone else. Um, each of these Grand Masters presided over a three-tiered organization. The top tier was the headquarters in Jerusalem, and that included the Grand Masters and, and uh, their immediate officials, such as the Marshal. And they, in fact, resemble a king's court, where the king is at the top, and then he has 
the chief barons who are around him who fill these offices of chancellor and chamberlain and butler and, and constable. And, and so again, it's like a mirror image of that feudal government and also a mirror image of the papal court where you have the pope at the top and he is advised by a council of cardinals. So it, this is a medieval institution. We see mirrored, they're similar in each of these cases. Okay, do you understand that concept? Okay. Uh, the majority of the remaining brothers were Western Knights, um, and so they didn't recruit in the Holy Land. I mean, they didn't, they didn't convert anybody. They didn't recruit in the lands where they were. But most of the Hospitallers and Templars were French, and, and the Hospitallers were recruited a lot in England also. Uh, the Templars recruited in France, and the Teutonic Knights, which fought in, mostly in uh, the Eastern Front in, in Europe, were German. And so almost all the Teutonic Knights were German, also Polish. There were a lot of Polish um, participation. And so here, now on this map, I've outlined for you uh, where most of their holdings were. Actually, both the Hospitallers and the Templars held lands all over Europe. And I could have done a map where I showed the different districts of the Hospitallers, which were all over Europe. But some of their most important holdings, the Hospitallers were especially strong in England. And here we see this just huge number of hospitals all over England. Um, here, this purple one is their headquarters in England, right there. Actually, that's in Lo that's um, it's not in London. It's it's really about in Canterbury, uh, where the head of the English Church is in Canterbury, and so that one is in Canterbury. And this right here is their one woman's house. Wait, no, it's this one. This is a different color. It's their. It's their no. Wait a minute. The sisters, no, it's the green one, is the sisters. Okay, all the blue ones are their hospitals. And that's quite a lot. Okay, here are the main Templar houses in France and in Spain, in Burgundy, part of, of Europe here. And so you can see how, he, these are only the main ones. You know, they have minor houses too. They have priories in other places. And we're not showing any of them in Germany. But the, an extraordinary number of, um, uh, priories, and this is where they get all their wealth, of course. It's a huge, enormous amount of wealth. Another thing we have to, and I didn't put this in the notes, but the Templars were so important in the trade routes that go from uh, France and Spain to the Holy Land, and so important in developing trade that they became the bankers of Europe. They actually replaced the Jews, who were at first the bankers of Europe. Now the Templars take over that banking facility, and they become just incredibly wealthy because they control the trade routes and all the investment cash of Europe. And this is how they become so powerful. Uh, here is another um, uh, castle on the seashore um, uh, showing the building of these castles. The next tier down, the European, uh, uh, the European provinces, the Hospitallers call them priories. These are all these little, little places that we saw, saw on the map. Each one, each province was governed by provincial masters or priors. What they did was divide all of Europe into provinces, not necessarily states like France, Germany, Italy, but each each state, like France, was divided into about six provinces, Germany into about six provinces. It's as if they ruled an entire country, uh, their domain, and they divided it into provinces, and each province was governed by provincial masters, or in the case of the Hospitallers, they called them priors. And each province or priory sent one-third of their revenues to the headquarters in Jerusalem. Also, each province supplied troops, and they paid taxes, and often they made payments in kind, like if they raised a lot of grain, they would send grain. If they raised a lot of wine, they would send wine. The bottom tier, okay, that was the middle tier, the province. Each province contained a number of convents or religious houses, and those are those dots I showed you. Um, the administrative centers were staffed by a handful of brethren, and some had houses for sisters. 
The heads of male convents were called commanders or preceptors and were assisted by a chamberlain or a claviger. Okay. And here is the seal of Hugh de Revel, the Grand Master of the Hospitallers, so that you can see his brother Hugh Custos. Custos means Grand Master. Okay, yeah, question, Travis. Were there provincial houses training grounds for knights, or did they work like a, a normal uh, monastery? No, they didn't work like, well, they, yes and no is <laughs> the answer to that question. They were more recruiting grounds because, you know, knights, knights were trained from the time they were five years old. So what they did was recruit knights who were already trained. They didn't take in children. And by this time, the monastic orders mostly took in adults also. Um, so they, they didn't take in children. They took in knights who were raised to be knights from childhood. And they were recruiting centers, and they were also money-making centers because they would have lay brothers there who would farm the land. They would have peasants attached, would farm the land, farm the vineyards, the fisheries, you know, all the resources that they had. And they were income-producing centers. There were very few actual brothers there who did the overseeing, and most of the peasants did the work. But they also recruited troops to send to the Holy Land, and they recruited people who might be the head of one of their little convents who had very few people in them. It's a money-making machine is what it is. Okay. Um, and uh, at each convent, the, um, the head of the convent was responsible for the administration, or of, of the um, province, were responsible for the administration of properties in their district. And they paid a proportion of their income to their own province or priory. Actually, this is each convent was responsible for the administration of the properties in their area that they controlled, and they paid a proportion of their income to their own province or priory. So it's a, it's a real, it's a vast money-making setup here. The chapters or meetings were held at each levels. The conventual chapters that would be in each of the convents met weekly. The provincial chapters met annually or yearly. And here's an example of the hospitaller law, one of the laws. It is decreed that every prior beyond the sea, and that would be in, the, in Europe, should have a register which he should keep in his treasury in which register should be entered all the rents, lands, vines, and meadows. Every commander should receive from the prior that part of the register which relates to his commandery. So they're, they're required to take detailed records uh, to account for uh, what they're, what they're um, administering. And here is uh, the castle of uh, the Templars in Paris, okay, the dungeon or, or castle of the Templars in Paris. And, and it's very grand. It towers over everything uh, in the whole city. The officials were obliged to seek counsel or consent on certain issues, but enjoyed a considerable freedom. Because of the distance, the Grand Masters could not closely supervise. Uh, what they did was send out legates, and they were called Masters de Samar, uh, Grand Commanders or Visitors. They were actually a legate, just like the Papal Legates, when the Pope sent out legates to visit all of his provinces and churches. Well, the Grand Masters sent out legates who were delegated to represent the Grand Master in the West and to visit all of them. Now, how did the Templars fall? Well, power and prosperity made them the object of envy and suspicion. As I said, they were just enormously wealthy. Besides all of the land and the money-making properties they owned, they were the trading, the bankers of all trade in Europe, and so they were just, and they were in charge of all the trade. They, I mean, they had taken over all the trade. When King Philip IV of France ordered their arrest on charges of heresy, their downfall was rapid. The loss of Acre in 1291 meant the end of the Crusader states in the East, and, and the Templars were blamed. And after all, they were, they did set themselves up as the defenders of the Holy Land. So they were blamed when Acre fell in 1291, then pretty much, except for just some tiny enclaves, the Crusader states were gone. 
Cyprus was still there. Rhodes was still there. Here is the seal of Philip the, the Fair, who was the king of France, who actually caused the destruction of the Templars. Um, proposals were raised to reform the order when uh, Acre fell in 1291 uh, because they had to find some new reason for being. They had to find some new new uh, cause to devote themselves to. There were movements to amalgamate it with the Hospitallers. There were movements to bring in fresh leadership from the outside. The Templars resisted any changes. They didn't want any changes to their organization, but their reputation was fading because they had failed to protect the Holy Land. In October 1307, King Philip IV ordered the sudden arrest of all the Templars in France. And he had actually, around the 1st of October, he had secretly sent out orders that they were to be arrested. And then a big surprise, uh, at the end of the month, um, uh, his men uh, burst into their, into their um, main headquarters in France and arrested them all. They were accused of forcing um, entrance to uh, uh, forcing those who were entering the order into obscene and heretical initiations. And during the initiation, they were supposed to have denied Christ and spat on the cross and, and, and also committed all kinds of heretic, heretical atrocities. Um, harassed and tortured by Philip the Fair's men, most of the knights confessed. Pope Clement V had been surprised. He had not been consulted by the King of France. The King of France was far more powerful than the Pope by this time. The Popes had really lost all their power since the time of uh, Innocent III. Pope Clement V had not been consulted. He was in indignant, and the arrest was, a fact, an affront to papal authority. It was a deliberate affront, and it was um, clearly showed that Philip was more powerful than the Pope. In November of 1307, Pope Clement tried to take over the affair. Here is, here is a portrait of uh, Clement V on, on his coin. Okay. Uh, what Clement did was to arrest the Templars in other lands, and in 1312 he held the Council of Vienne. The Pope suppressed the order himself and granted its lands to the Hospitallers. And in March 1314, the Grand Master Jacques de Molay and the preceptor of Normandy, Geoffrey de Charnay, were burned at the stake. Okay. In the Iberian Peninsula, the Pope allowed the Templar possessions to be used to create new orders. And in Spain, uh, the new order was the Montesa. In Portugal, the Order of Cristo. Uh, was the order that absorbed the Templar possessions. Well, the affair of the fall of the Templars caused a widespread scandal. Many European rulers and literate populations were unconvinced of the Templars' guilt, and what they thought Philip the Fair did was just grab all their wealth, and they may well have been right. I mean, but the Templars were a threat to Europe. Uh, I mean, I think the Templars were a threat to Europe. Do you see any reason why the Templars would have been a threat to Europe? Any idea? No? Stephen? Not with a pope that's as inept. Their only real threat to Europe would have been if, would be if the pope decided to unify them all as some kind of force underneath the papacy where he could actually try to institute some kind of royal kingship for the pope. But instead of actually opposing France, he decided, well, I'll just kind of follow his lead and arrest the rest of them, and he got rid of any kind of threat the Templars could have posed. Well, why do you think he didn't support the Templar? Why, why did he go against the Templars? Why do you think the Pope did that? Well, I would guess part of it is because he had lost a lot of his legitimacy over time, just the papacy had lost a lot of its power, but yeah. one would think that a strong leader, if, they, if one had just happened to come into the papacy at the right time, that they could have unified the Templars underneath his leadership, as opposed to the Grand Master's leadership. And it could have posed a direct threat to all of the kingships around Europe. You don't think they were a direct threat even without papal leadership? What do you think, Matthew? I think that you know, the reason, I mean, they had an incredible land base and economic base. Um, mm -hmm. Even even without uh, pap you know, that, even without the, a strong papal base behind them, you know, they, it, in reality, if the, if the Templars want, really wanted to, they probably could have uh, created some sort of uh, Uprising, you know, had it, had it uh, been in their design to do so, they you know they could have really posed a great threat to uh, the leadership of your of uh, at least the mainland. Yeah, I think so too. You know, 
you know, and the reason I think so is because they've got an international organization with convents in every single country of Europe. They've got uh, a grand master at the head of this whole organization who now has to leave the Holy Land and go to France because he's thrown out of the Holy Land. Now he's directly in Europe. And it is, it is a, an organization that is wealthier and more powerful than the papacy or any individual country in Europe. I think, I think it posed, posed a tremendous threat, and Philip the Fair recognized that. Um, the, the other question is, I mean, was Philip the Fair just greedy and wanted to grab all their wealth? And that's the usual accusation that's made against him, that he was just greedy and, and, and um, hungry for their wealth and, you know, corrupt and all of that. What do you think, Matthew? I'm, sure, I'm, certain, I'm certain that, you know, money and power, I mean, that's always his driving force, whether, whether or not that was the only, you know, whether that was the main driving force or the uh, or the only driving force, then uh, that, you know, that's something I just don't know enough about. But yeah, I, I wouldn't doubt that you know that that's at least an ele an, an element, if not um, maybe not the element. Yeah, but well, usually I mean, greed is an easy accusation to make when anybody makes a power play like that. But but if we can think, if there is a rational threat. I mean, if, if this organization really posed a threat to all of Europe, I mean, if it could have been organized right, it could have taken over all of Europe and superseded both the papacy and the kings. Um, and I, I just wonder if Philip the Fair didn't, didn't see them in that kind of a way. I, I mean, you have to look for rational reasons. I, I think greed is a simplistic reason to pick. Easy. It's an easy thing, surface kind of thing to say. Well, he was just greedy for all of that money and wealth and power. But but money and wealth and power is a real threat against people and organizations. Yeah. I think also in the sense that at the time rulers were seeing as being ruled by you know God gave them the right to rule, and so by the Templars and the Hospitallers coming in and taking away their rule by finance kind of posed as a threat because they're saying, well, they're taking my finances away, they're taking slowly yeah. my banking away, which equals my land, which equals my property. Pretty soon they're just going to go ahead and take everything. And I see that more as a threat that he's seeing that he's slowly being eroded away. Yeah, and the question is, was he that smart to see that um, that, that was a possibility? And I think he was. I mean, people were not... I mean, they they may not have been as sophisticated as we are, but they're not dumb. I mean, they're just as smart as we are. Yeah, Stephen. Um, I was just wondering if, in hindsight, people had seen whether or not the Templars actually had any designs upon taking leadership or forcing some kind of dominion over Western Europe. I have never seen any any direct evidence that they wanted to or would. I, I'm just raising the question of whether Philip the Fair, as a rational human being, might not have seen that they would indeed pose a threat if the right person came along and organized them. Uh, I mean, I would, I would see that the potential there in the future. I just wonder if he didn't see that. I think it's too simplistic to say he was just greedy for their wealth. I mean, and, and, and as Matthew said, there's rarely just one reason people do things, but uh, it's a possibility. Well, the affair caused widespread scandal and not everybody thought the Templars were guilty. I mean they could have been framed by Philip and, and I think that's a real possibility too. Here is the seal of the master of the temple which is kind of an interesting. Uh, somebody made the comment last time I showed this that uh, the is it the Masons who have the same seal that they use? Somebody might have made that comment. Okay. Philip IV seemed obsessed with imposition of royal overlordship, and the Templar organization resembled the universal church in ways. That was exactly the point that I was making. It was independent of all the new national states, and about two-thirds of the Templar houses were in the French monarchy. Uh, these included the prosperous agricultural areas of the north, the key trading regions like Champagne, and along the vital routes to the Mediterranean. And this represented a rich financial prize for the French king. Well, how about the Northern Crusades? The Northern Crusades uh, are also one of the uh, one of the uh, side issues, you might say, of the Crusades to the Holy Land. Uh, here's Philip the Fair again. He, he's taking the uh, 
the throne of justice in this uh, portrait of Philip the Fair. On the northern fringes of Europe, there were extensive page pagan regions that still existed in the 13th century, and their eradication was one of the goals of crusading, and Innocent III really got the ball rolling. Um, the conquest and settlement really began in the 1190s when Pope Celestine III and Innocent III extended the missionary church among the Livs, or the Livonians, in, on the river Divina. Uh, and from that point forward, there was a perpetual crusade in the Baltic. But remember, as early as the Second Crusade, remember when when St. Bernard was preaching the Second Crusade and some of the Germans asked if they could go against the pagans on their borders. So, I mean, the movement had some precursors, but it really got rolling under Innocent III, who called a great crusade. Um, and after that, there was a perpetual crusade in the Baltic. In 1215, Christian, a Cistercian monk of the Polish Abbey of Lechno, was consecrated Bishop of Prussia. And, and Prussia was pagan at that time, and the first conquest that the Teutonic Knights made was in Prussia. In 1230, Bishop Albert of Riga with the Sword Brothers conquered Livonia, which is modern Latvia. And meanwhile, the Danes had been attacking the Pomeranian coast from Lubeck to Danzig, Finland, Osel, and Prussia. And let's take a look at a map here. Um, here is the area um, that was first, uh, this is Prussia. And this is the area that um, was first attacked by the Teutonic Knights and conquered. And later they moved over into this area, which is Pomerania. This area was Lithuania, and it was never conquered by the Teutonic Knights. The Lithuanians were quite amazing in that they were able to hold off all the Crusaders. They had this very defensible land um, surrounded by swamps, and also they were determined not to become Christians. I mean, they wanted to remain pagan, and they were strong enough and well enough organized to hold off. Now, this area is the Curonians, the Let, the Estonians, and the Livs, uh, or the Livonians. This area is usually called Livonia. Um, and they were conquered in the 1240s. This area here was conquered by the Danes in the 1220s, and actually they founded colonies in this area while the Swedes went up in here and founded colonies. And all of them, you know, the, re the, the fact that all these people are grabbing land and taking over land and forming colonies, and in addition to taking the land they're importing peasants from Germany, especially into Prussia uh, and into um, uh, Pomerania here. They're, they're bringing peasants. And this movement is often also called the land clearance to the east. They're clearing the lands of the east, and they're importing German peasants and populating the land with Germans. And they're giving these peasants new freedom and lots of independence as bribes to get them there and, and larger rewards for their work. And um, we end up with ethnically mixed areas, but with the Germans predominating. And the German peasants are given far more privileges than the native peasants. And so they're, they're taking over this land. Um, in fact, uh, some authors of World War II saw this as a sort of proto-Nazi movement. Uh, they're totally wrong. I mean, the mentality is much different, but, but the, the fact that the Germans were expanding into this area that reminded people in World War II of that movement. But the Germans weren't the only ones who were doing it, because also the Poles were going in that direction, and the Poles were, were fighting off the Teutonic Knights who were trying to conquer the Poles, and the Poles were Christians. And by this time, and so they were fighting off the, the Teutonic Knights who tried to conquer them. So it's as much a land grab as, and to make these guys rich as it is a conversion movement. And here in this area where the Danes settled up here, um, 
they put colonies in there to control that land, and the Swedes put colonies all in here. This is Finland. Um, in addition to converting them, they colonized the land, and they used that as a kind of imperial expansion movement. So it's, it's more than just conversion. And Lithuania, as we said, was never conquered. And what the Lithuanians did in time was to make a treaty with the Poles. And the Poles and the Lithuanians together fought off the Teutonic Knights and, and kept them from uh, conquering both Lithuania and Poland. But in the process of that, the Lithuanians converted to Christianity, not because the Teutonic Knights converted them, but because they wanted wanted to be allies of Poland to fight off the Teutonic Knights. So that's kind of an interesting development. So the Lithuanians were never conquered by the Teutonic Knights. Okay, In 1220, um, the Teutonic Knights took northern, northern Estonia. The Swedes were soon to launch a, a series of campaigns against Finland, where they clashed with the Russians, who were who were carrying on a crusade coming from the east to the west in the opposite direction. So here we have uh, crusaders from Novgorod in Russia going, uh, going westward in crusading movements as well. Three orders were involved. The main order were, was the Order of the Teutonic Knights. Another was the Order of the Hospital of St. Mary of Jerusalem. And this is another Hospitaller order, and also the Sword Brothers, who were a who were very similar to the Teutonic Knights, and they were just a similar uh, group. There were also um, uh, there was also another group called the Livonian Knights, and in the end, all of these groups were united together under the title of. Um, the Teutonic Knights. In other words, the Teutonic Knights absorbed all the other orders. Between Livonia and Christian Germany, there remained a wide belt of pagan territory. Another missionary bishop attempted to convert the pagan uh, Prussians with the assistance of a small military order, the Knights of Dobrizen, and they failed. Okay, in the end, it was the Teutonic Knights who took everything. Uh, when, the, when the Knights of Dubrozen failed, Duke Conrad of Masovia called in the Teutonic Lights, Knights. His lands were being menaced by the pagan Prussians. The Teutonic Knights had grown from modest origins in the late 12th century, but by now they were a powerful trans-European organization. They actually had these modest origins at the time St. Bernard called the Second Crusade. And now by this time, by the 13th century, they were a powerful trans-European organization. Their headquarters were still in Palestine, but they had become involved in Europe when the King of Hungary had given the order uh, that a section of his front, uh, given the order a section of his frontier in Transylvania. But the Knights had been expelled for trying to establish a state within a state. Now, the Teutonic Knights were invited into Prussia by Conrad of Masovia. They rapidly absorbed the order of Do, uh, de Brisen and began carving out a state for themselves. And I found this picture. I don't have a picture of the Teutonic Knights, but these are German uh, knights. Actually, they're going hunting uh, in the time period that we're talking about here, the 13th century. And this is actually King Conrad of Bohemia and an attendant hawking. But, but this is from a German manuscript, which would be um, uh, quite typical of the uh, art of that period and the knights of that period, how they would show them. And notice that this is a crusading cross here. Without regard to the legitimate rights of Duke Conrad or of the rights of the existing missionary church, the um, uh, Teutonic Knights conquered all of Prussia. In 1226, their master received from the Emperor Frederick II the status of Imperial Prince for all future conquests in Prussia. And so he's given a mandate um, from uh, the Emperor Frederick II. And remember who he was? He had carried out a crusade. We'll talk about his crusade a little bit more. Uh, but he, he had carried out a crusade in the Holy Land, but he just gave the Teutonic Knights the mandate to conquer everything in Prussia. In 1234, Pope Gregory IX took the Knights' territory under his protection as a papal fief. 
The Teutonic Knights absorbed the Sword Brothers in Livonia after the Sword Brothers had been defeated by pagan Lithuanians in 1236. But there were fears about the order's ability to resist the Mongols who were now pressing on the East European frontiers. And I mentioned that the Russians had been pressing on these Eastern frontiers. Now the Mongols overwhelmed the Russians. Uh, from 1237 to 1239, central Russia was conquered by Genghis Khan, and in 1240, the Ukraine uh, was conquered. And here you can see, here are the domin dominions of Genghis Khan, who is creeping into that area. And here are the dominions of his successors that include all of the Russian principalities. So you see they're right bordering on Lithuania and all of these conquests that the, that the Teutonic Knights have made right in this area. And so the, the Mongols are a terrifying um, uh, force that they're, they're facing uh, in the east. In 1241, Poland and Hungary were invaded by the Mongols. And in 1241, the German army was defeated at Legnica. And Pope Gregory the, uh, the 11th proclaimed a crusade against the Mongols. And in 1243, Pope Innocent IV confirmed it. This probably led to the extraordinary privilege granted in 1245 um, that uh, the Teutonic Knights could grant plenary crusader indulgences to Germans who assisted them against the Prussians. By 1250, the Teutonic Knights, interestingly, had established an independent state. They had established their own independent country ruled by the Teutonic Knights. They could and did wage a perpetual crusade to support their own country. And they were assisted by merchants from Lübeck and Bremen and by parties of invading crusaders. Um, they had embarked on the conquest of the indigenous pagan tribes. So they built for themselves their very own state and they were reinforced by recruits who constantly came to join the German crusaders. Here is Pope Innocent IV, who was pope at this time, who actually gave them the power to grant indulgences to any of their recruits. And here is that independent state that they founded, and this is roughly the territory that it comprised. I mean, it's their very own state. Now, you know, if Philip IV saw that, um, and, and, and connected it to ideas about the Templars who held lands uh, through the entirety of Europe. I mean, I would see the logic of that, of that kind of a, a connection there with the Templar, with the um, Teutonic Knights forming their own state. But there were setbacks. After the Prussian revolts in 1242 and 1260, the order had to fight long wars of recovery. The second Prussian revolt in 1260 was set off by a defeat by the Lithuanians at Durban in 1260. A drive toward Skoff was halted and the Knights were crushed by Prince Alexander Nevsky of Novgorod. Uh, there was a battle on Lake uh, Pipus on 5 April 1242. Uh, and this was the battle where Alexander Nevsky, this is a very famous battle where he drove them away. They always had to face the might and resilience of successful Lithuanian rulers, and so they were never conquered by the Lithuanians. In Prussia itself, the Teutonic Knights advanced inexorably. They employed a combination of armed force with preservation of local rights and social status. They also secured their hold by granting generous terms to settlers lured from northern and eastern Germany. Okay. The German settlements were relatively dense in West Prussia, but only a thin upper class. Um, the further settlement moved eastward. Following the loss of Acre in 1291 and a temporary period in Venice, the order relocated, and their headquarters was in Marienburg in 1309. And this tacitly acknowledged its true power base. Marienburg is in Prussia, and of course, this is the state they created. The loss of the Holy Land in 1291 deprived the Knights of their eastern possessions and led to the question of their reason for being, their raison d'etre. Um, the Templars uh, 
had been suppressed. The Hospitallers found a new base on Rhodes. The Teutonic Knights made Prussia the basis of their own very own state, as we saw. They had extensive possessions in Prussia, Pomerelia, and Newmark, and Livonia. From their Prussian fortresses, senior officers governed a complex society. The upper echelons of German urban patricians plus German, Polish, and Prussian landed gentry. gentry. And they had a peasantry of relatively privileged Germans and underprivileged Prussians. The knights formed the administrative class, and they used a sophisticated courier system in order to communicate. Um, the rich agricultural lands of Prussia provided them a wonderful income. The knights were also involved in the trading of the Hanseatic League, and thus there was considerable prosperity in this state that the, uh, that the Teutonic Knights built. And here, the, some of their land is eroded, but this is, this is Newmark here, and these are the lands they controlled. And these are the trading routes that fed into their country, the, uh, into the Hanseatic League, and the Hansa is in this area. The Hanseatic League was one of the most sophisticated merchant um, uh, uh, networks in northern Europe, and that this whole North Sea at uh, North Sea trade network fed into uh, their land. So they were enormously wealthy. Whereas the Templars controlled the trade in the Mediterranean, the Teutonic Knights controlled this North Sea network. Many foreign knights were attracted to Prussia to take part in sweeping raids named Ryson into pagan Lithuania. And they were almost, you know, a, a sort of pastime, a sort of fun thing to do, like going hunting or something. But this is raiding against the, the pagans. And so they did it for a kind of sport. But the conversion of the Lithuanians, who united with Poland, as I mentioned, undermined the order state. In 1410, the Polish-Lithuanian forces crushed the knights at the Battle of Tannenberg. The Grand Master and most of the senior knights and 4,000 brothers were slain. A large war indemnity was imposed on them, and thus the knights adopted grasping fiscal policies and undermined previously granted rights to their peasants. Uh, those were the rights that were granted to entice the German settlers to Prussia. The order now became a rest home for minor German nobility. And uh, an opposition crystallized in an association of German urban patricians. So an urban group rose up in all the cities. Of course, they were the, the trading network of the Hansa League had formed lots of cities in northern um, Germany in that area and in Prussia. And so now an urban um, elite was rising to fight off these feudal knights who were, who were their aristocrats. And so that's kind of what happened. It's part of the citification. And uh, it, was, it was formed of both the urban elites and the landed gentry called the Prussian Bund. In the 1450s, King Ladislaw of Poland renewed the war against the order, and the Bund decided it was time to overthrow the knights. In the Thirteen Years' War of 1454 to 1466, uh, the order lost its West Prussian lands to Poland, and the Grand Master now became a vassal of the Polish king. Marienburg was sold to the Poles by the order's mercenaries to recoup unpaid wages. And that, in fact, was the end of the Teutonic Knights. So we sort of trace them from their beginning to their end. I want to go back to this map here, because I had the capital of Marienburg on here. Uh, let's see, which one did I have Marienburg on? So that you could see exactly where that capital was. Well, I think it was on an earlier map here. Okay. There it is. Okay. When we looked at the original map of their original 
um, settlement. Marienburg is right here just south of Danzig and that became their capital of the whole order. Okay, so what do you think of the Teutonic Knights? Any rea We're not going to do the Spanish Crusade tonight, but we'll save that for next week because we're almost out of time. But what do you all think uh, of the Teutonic Knights? Any reactions, questions, comments, comparisons to the Templars? <laughs> yeah, Travis? It's a little more clear now why Philip the Fair uh, seized their assets. You know, I think Philip the Fair could look at the Teutonic Knights and, I mean, they were knights. They were, they were fighting men. Their, their, their whole reason for being was to fight. And this is what happened with, uh, with the Teutonic Knights. And so I think he might see the parallels. Um, yeah, Matthew. Um, seems, you know, we see, you know, we see the rise and fall of one empire. You know, if, um, if they're not, if they're not empires end up, you know, of a political nature, they're an empire, you know, within, a, you know, of an esoteric nature, I guess is the word I'm looking for. That's probably not it. But, um, you know, I mean, you see the rise and fall, you know, they reach their peak, and they, you know, the Templars, and the Hospitalis, and the Teutons, you know, they have all these, you know, castles and ha and convents, et cetera, et cetera, all over the place, you know. The Teutons even have their have their own nation. Yes, I uh, know. And it's then, extraordinary. Uh, and then it gets then it slowly but surely gets eaten away. You, know. you see, you know, history is repeating itself over and over again. Or else they're having very similar developments, and so that might be why Philip the Fair, you know, wanted to get rid of those Templars and, and, and disband them before they had the idea of conquering uh, territories as well. Any, any other comparisons or uh, uh, comments on these these military movements. We haven't really looked at Spain, but Spain is Spain is kind of a different case um, in a way. It's it's um, uh, the the formula works a little bit differently there. Why do you think the Teutonic Knights could gain so much power in these pagan areas? Um, any ideas about that? Yeah, Matthew. They are in an area that no one else really wants to go into. I mean, you know, pe you know, people. I mean, the, the uh, you know, lands in France and in uh, and in the Holy Roman Empire in Italy, in in England, you know, they're already Christianized and everything. However, in Prussia and uh, northeastern Europe, it's it's all pagan. Um, you know, it's in it's in an area that no one no one else really wants. I mean, they want to go to Christianize them, but. As far as having a as, as far as having a political force there, at that point in time, no one else really wanted to be there. So well, it's not that they wanted to be there. You know, the pagan the pagan people who lived in those areas, the Wends, the Laps, the Lithuanians, the Estonians, the Latvians, um, the Finns, um, are relatively primitive in their organization compared to the rest of Europe. I mean, they're they're simple tribal organizations. And they're not sophisticated politically. Um, their religions are kind of animistic, and they they resemble the old Viking religion in some ways. I mean, they're they're kind of on that order in the same way. Nature religions, animistic, um, and and. It, it seems easy for Christianity to sort of override that, partly because they force them to convert, but also because um, it's a strong religion in that it it brings together. Uh, it's more centralized. It's a more centralized religion, whereas the pagan religions are, are very loosely organized and they're not coherent. Um, and and uh, everything isn't tied together as neatly as the Christians, but also politically they're disunified and they're not very sophisticated, which is one reason that the, that the Prussians, uh, not the Prussians, but the, um, uh, the Teutonic Knights can come in with superior political systems and organize them. Uh, yeah, comment, Stephen. Well, plus it just seems like the entire rule of the Teutonic Knights was based upon there was actually a push on the part, on, for a large part, from the rest of Europe to go out and kind of civilize the wild parts of the East. But yeah. kind of the reason for their fall was after they had been ruling for a while, they really no longer had a power base from which to draw some more military personnel and things like that. And they were actually out there in, on the frontier without the support of the rest of Europe behind them anymore. They were simply out there on their own. And Good point. They were yeah. forced, they were just basically on a crossroads. 
And even though they had a lot of support in the beginning, they just couldn't continue it over a long period of time. Yeah, that's an excellent point. You know, whereas the Templars and the Hospitallers had convents all over Europe, the, uh, the Teutonic Knights were concentrated in Germany and, and Russia, uh, Germany and Prussia. And, and, so, and so they were drawing their manpower from Germany and Poland and from a very small, compact area. And again, again, I think if Philip the Fair could see that that's what the Teutonic Knights could do, what could the Templars do with all of all of Europe to draw on if they wanted to become militaristic ab against all of Europe? Um, another comparison is, you know, you know the to, the Templars were really controlling the trade in the Mediterranean, and all this trade where they had their con their convents in all of France and in Spain, and they had their, their Spanish uh, holdings here, and it was all funneled through Marseille and Barcelona and Venice and into, uh, into all of the, the ports in uh, the Holy Land and Constantinople and through here, and the Templars had control of all of that trade, and so they were extremely wealthy. Likewise, uh, the Teutonic Knights had this whole trade in the, in the uh, North Sea area. And so it, it's, it's really kind of strange and ironic that they both end up in control of large trading networks and becoming bankers and, and controllers of wealth in that way. But uh, uh, certainly they're a danger to Europe, but I think the Templars were more of a danger than the Teutonic Knights were. Um, as far as civilizing, uh, of course civilization is a matter of point of view, but. <laughs> But um, I'm sure they thought of themselves as Christianizing and civilizing pagan, backward people, defined as backward, because a lot of them, like the Laps and the Finns, were herders and um, uh, shepherds and that kind of an economy rather than urban and rather than agriculturalists. And so they looked at them as not being as advanced as they were. So. Anyway, okay, well, we've just about run out of time. And we didn't get to the Spanish orders, but we'll get to them next week. And next week we'll also do, uh, well, we might do them the week after next. We're, we're going to do the Albigensian Crusade next week, so be sure to read the Song of the Cathar Wars. And the Albigensian Crusade is another crusade, Innocent Called, and it's a really interesting one in southern France. So we'll see you next week. <laughs>